Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Soulcast Media Live event. If everybody can see me and can hear me, please give me a thumbs up on your end. That's how we know all the audio and tech is working. And that's the funny thing about these virtual events. Sometimes it's hard to tell. So if everybody can hear me and can see me on your end, whether you are dialing in on your phone or on your desktop, laptop, please give me a thumbs up, which you can do that. There's a little kind of function on the bottom. So just let me know if everything is working on your end. But I want to welcome everybody to our Soulcast Media Live event today. I am so excited for today's topic, which is about leadership in a global world. This is a topic very close to my heart, as well as my guests, who I'm going to introduce in just a few minutes. But before we kick, start, kick off this I want to do a quick housekeeping tip of what to expect. Now, I know sometimes with these events, you may sometimes see the home screen pop up again. It's a weird thing with LinkedIn and we're streaming from a different platform onto LinkedIn. So if you ever encounter the screens not working, you can't see me or my guests, just refresh your screen, your phone, your desktop, and it should bring you back to this live event. I like to give everybody a heads up so no one's like, ah, what's going on? So in terms of what's going to be happening today, this event is going to be about 45 minutes long. And my guest and I, we are going to be talking about all things leadership in a global world. Now, for those who've never attended one of my Soulcast Media Live events, I want to welcome you all. I do see some familiar names, so welcome back. We host these about every two weeks or so, and my topics are always about career, communications, and of course, leadership. Now, for those who don't know who I am, I'm going to do a really quick introduction. So my name is Jessica Chen, and I am the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media. And we are a global communications training company. So we work with some of the top companies around the world to help individuals, teams, as well as executives improve their public speaking. Prior to starting Soulcast Media, I used to be a former Emmy award-winning TV news reporter. I was in the news industry for over 10 years. And one of the reasons why I started Soulcast Media was because I was not a great communicator. I'm fairly shy, introverted. I'm a huge overthinker. And I realized when I first started in my career, I really needed to improve my communications if I wanted to rise up in my career. Fortunately, I was in an industry that I was forced to speak and learn to speak every single day, public speaking. And after almost 10 years in news, I was like, you know what? I can actually teach people this. So four years ago, I went out and I started Soulcast Media and very, very fortunate to have worked with so many people around the world. I'm also a top LinkedIn learning instructor. My courses have reached over 1 million people, which is incredible for LinkedIn learning. So I'm very happy about that. And for those who've never seen my courses, be sure to check it out on LinkedIn learning. You can just simply type in my name and all my courses. I believe I have nine now at this point. You can check it out and it's all communications related. So without further ado, let's kickstart our event. So today, my guest and I, we are going to be talking about leadership in a global world. And we want you to know that this event, well, we're very happy that you're here. But as much as it is for Patrick and I to be chatting about this and sharing our favorite tips, we want to make sure that this is about you. So if you have any questions, any thoughts, anything that comes to mind as Patrick and I are chatting, please throw it into the chat function. Because as we're talking, if there's a question, I'm going to pull it up and I want us to answer it to help you. Let us know, are you working at a company that's perhaps global? Or are you interested in wanting to work at a company that has a global presence? Whatever it is, we want to let you know that this event is for you. So let me introduce my guest. So Patrick is actually someone who I met not too long ago. And one of the reasons why I wanted Patrick to join me on this is because I really feel he has this global mindset. During the day, of course, Patrick is the executive director of Harvard Business School's online and executive education. So there's no doubt that he's always thinking about, hmm, how can I expand Harvard Business School's presence in a global world? But I'm not going to do the intro. I'm going to have Patrick do the intro. So I'm going to invite him up right now. So Patrick, welcome to our Soulcast Media Live event. 
Hey, Jessica, thanks for having me. I feel a lot of pressure on my communication skills here, given uh, given your own introduction. You are going to be fantastic. So I'm very excited for you to join. I did a really, really brief introduction of who you are, the work that you do. I didn't mention that you're also an author too, but for our, our audience who's meeting you and seeing you for the first time, give us a quick intro of who you are, the work that you do. Sure. So Patrick Mullane, I, as you noted, am the executive director of HPS Online and Executive Education, which uh, the best way to think about it is all of the non-degree things we do at Harvard Business School fall under my purview. So there's the MBA program and there's non-degree programs uh, that uh, many are probably familiar with that are offered by schools like us and, and other institutions around the world. I've been at Harvard Business School for about uh, seven years, uh, and before that, I was in the private sector uh, doing various jobs. I'd been an entrepreneur. I'd run a manufacturing company. I'd been a consultant. It seemed like I did a lot. And uh, and then before that, I was in the military myself um, right out of college. Um, and I came back to HBS because I got my own MBA at Harvard Business School uh, back in 1999. So I always had a thought that after doing some private sector work, maybe it'd be interesting to come back. And uh, so here I am, and it's been a wonderful experience. So I'm really thrilled to jump into our conversation as well as I'm sure our audience is very eager. We have over 45 people who are live with us right now who I'm sure have so many thoughts on, okay, leadership in the global world. So to back up a little bit, Patrick, so for those who are wondering, so Patrick and I, before, Patrick, when you and I were behind the scenes, you mentioned that you've had to always restart. And let me define this for folks who are hearing this. So you are a military brat, meaning you grew up in a military family. And as a result of that, you've had to move around a lot from city to city and essentially restart and start over every single time, meaning probably have to make new friends, you know, rebuild who you are within that community. Tell me, how did you approach introducing yourself, getting to know people, building relationships with new people every few years? Because I feel like for a lot of people, that can be really stressful too. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. It's it's funny. There was kind of an A B test in my family, if you will, because I have a twin sister. And so uh, what I'll say is that we're very different. So what worked for me didn't work for her. She did not like moving around. She didn't enjoy those new experiences. She was kind of a homebody. Whereas I uh, tended to see those things as adventures. And in fact, I got a little bored if we stayed in one place too long. When we went to a new place, one thing that did help me out, to be frank, is that often there would be other military kids who were in the same boat. So that's always helpful to, to make those connections, but not always. And I think that uh, part of it was I had parents who just encouraged us to kind of be out there and in all ways, you know, make sure you try it out for sports teams, be, be involved in school activities and so forth. And if you do those things, if you make yourself present in, in the presence of others who are engaging in activities you might also like, it's really hard to not end up um, making a connection in some way. So I think that really, uh, really helped me. And it really uh, solidified uh, in me this, this ability to connect with other people, uh, no matter the circumstances, very early in my life. Um, you know, most of my moving, I moved, lived in, I think, eight places before I was 10 years old or something like that, a ridiculous amount of moving. And then, and then in high school, I got to stay in one place. And I think that that, um, that or those early years really formed me in some way that's very unusual for for a kid and was very helpful to me in my in my life ever since then. I have no doubt that a lot of the things that you learned as a child of learning how to adapt, be flexible, it's also really relevant to today's topic, which is leadership in a global world. So yeah. I want to just start with that. What does today's title mean for you too? leadership in a global world? And I'm sure a lot of it has to do with your upbringing and your influences as well. But let me know, what is it? What does it mean to you? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I actually have given that some thought when we talked about what the title of this would be. And I think the uh, this is going to sound very cliche and very simple, but I believe it to be true after being a general manager my entire life is that it doesn't matter the culture, the country, the context is that people are people <laughs> that the same issues, problems, uh, successes you have with one group. Uh, are going to be uh, very, very similar, if not identical, to those you'll have with another group. We all have ambitions, dreams, jealousies, pettiness, uh, get frustrated about you know certain things. And, and so I found that uh, early on, I thought that that was an outlier thing. Like, you know, you work with a, I, I, my first general management job was in the military myself, where I was managing a team of, of uh, contractors of about 20 or 30 people. And um, and early on, you know, you don't know enough to know that everything you experience in an environment like that um, 
both the good and the bad, is just going to be the same in every job you'll have after that, but just in a different context. Um, you know, I often make the comment that when I applied, uh, found out about this job at Harvard Business School and wanted to come back to it, it was for the online job specifically to start. Um, the 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 requirements in the job description, I didn't fit a, a single one of them. But I did know that in the end, it was a leadership job. And if you can lead an organization that makes auto parts, you know, I really truly believe you can lead an organization that designs web pages uh, because all the problems are the same and they all start with people. And if you get the people right, everything else is easy. So I went a bit on a tangent there, but that's my answer to that question about the, about the global uh, aspect to this discussion is that people are people. I absolutely love that. And I cannot agree with you more. And it's funny because I'm in the process of actually writing a whole new communications course. And this one's actually teaching folks how to manage a global team. And as I'm literally knee deep in writing this content right now. And it's funny because everything that you're saying is exactly what I'm also talking about in this course. Yes, of course, there are different cultural nuances that we, we should be mindful of that's unique to every country. But you said it, Patrick. I think it's just simply understanding human nature and just, and that is something we can all learn, right? You, there's yeah. tons of books out there where people have written about how do people think, how do people behave, how do they react? And I truly agree with you. Just having that foundational understanding of human nature, it almost can give you, you're kind of halfway there in yeah. learning how to deal with people. Yeah, it's I think you're even you further. I think you're further along, but yes, I mean it's a it's a huge part of it, no doubt about it. I was trying to be conservative. I'm like, yeah, you're already 50 percent <laughs> there, but you're probably like you're you're 95 percent there. Yeah, <laughs> really. yeah. I think that's probably true. <laughs> right. So it's crazy though. Okay, so I really have to ask you this question because when you said this, I was like, I need to ask him about this because you said when you first applied for this job at Harvard Business School, you're looking at the job description, which many people look at job description, they're like, holy moly. I don't have any experience doing this. A lot of people would simply be like, mm, I probably won't get the job. But you still had that, you know what? I'm going to apply because I do have leadership abilities. So let me just, you know, do it. Can you walk me through what was going through your mind at that time? Yeah, actually, uh, this one I can draw a direct line back to my childhood. Is my parents were very, I mentioned earlier, very uh, big about getting us to, to take initiative and get involved in things. And um, you know, there was this uh, the, many things you get involved in in your school days, often, especially with athletics, there will be a tryout. Right. And, mm -hmm. and it's easy to self doubt and say, well, I'll never make it. Um, you know, I don't have what it takes. Um, and uh, I was into basketball all the time. And I remember my father and mother saying, hey, you know, stop commiserating about this and go try out and see what happens. Uh, now, here's the kicker. This isn't a Hollywood uh, happy ending. I, I didn't make the team. I got cut. So uh, but but even that lesson was I realized that I had overestimated my own skills relative to the other people who were trying out and that then I rededicated myself over the next uh, you know year, actually exactly a year. And the next year I went to the tryout for the team and I'll, I'll never forget this. The coach called me forward after the first day of tryouts. There were usually two cuts. There was a cut after the first day and a cut after the second day. Uh, um, by cut, I mean, for those who aren't familiar with the term, you know, people being removed from the mix mm -hmm. that just aren't going to be on the team. And uh, and he pulled me forward and said, hey, I want to tell everybody that Patrick here is going to make the team this year, which was shocking to me because, you know, I thought we still had one more day to go. Or everybody else did, but apparently I didn't. And he made he, he said, look, last year he, he wasn't ready. And I know he was in here practicing hard and and he's shown that he's gotten better. And this is what can happen if you get cut. So don't be discouraged. So that is that is uh, really, really stuck with me. And that that lesson about, you know, trying even when you don't think you have it, I think, is very important. Now, I also, um, you know, I also knew that in the case of Harvard Business School, Harvard Business School teaches leadership. Um, and so and, and understands the importance of, uh, of the, the leader having experience in doing that piece well, because if you can do the leadership piece well, as I alluded to earlier, you can learn the, the product. And so to their credit, I think they look past the fact that I didn't have, you know, 10 years of digital marketing experience and said, mm -hmm. oh, well, um, he knows the school because he went here. He's been a leader since he graduated from undergraduate school. Let's take a chance. And so here I am. I can't even imagine what that interview process must, must have been like, because you probably wowed them so much that they're like, you know what, okay. you just really like Patrick. And we just I don't know, I don't know about that. I'll, I'll tell you this. It was about 20 interviews. We don't do them short here. That was for sure. 
<laughs> you're like at this point, I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> I, I honestly, I think that's such a powerful story, though, because it kind of just shows that, and you just said it, it, it was linked to your childhood of, of like, you know, sometimes you just got to try, you have to make a convincing case out of it. And you're right, even though your skills on paper did not necessarily match this role, you were able to make other arguments that essentially yeah. help sell yourself as as a candidate right at the time yeah. and by the way i think that's that gets easier as you get more experience it's, it's i don't want to candy coat it either it's harder when you're younger because you don't have the breadth of experience right. but uh for those who might be on the younger uh, end of the spectrum who, who are tuning in um you know be conscious of that while you're learning because uh having a broad base of experiences can set you up for really cool opportunities later in life broad set of experiences i I want to echo that because I think sometimes a lot of us, when we're on our day-to-day -day working, right, we can get so siloed in doing just what we have to do, checking off that to-do list. But I always encourage folks to think about how can you expand your experience, expand your knowledge, expand your network, because honestly, the more things you can do, the more interesting of a person you yeah. are as well. I'd and like to think so. <laughs> for sure. Because, yeah, Patrick, I mean, you're an author too. And I know we've connected on that level too, because I'm in the process of writing a book. But I always encourage folks. And actually, uh, a few months ago, I had one of my friends come on who is, he actually, Long is the chairman of Citibank in the Asia region. And he said the exact same thing. He not only is he, of course, in the finance sector in a high leadership role, but he loves racing cars. He loves, you know, eating. Like he has a whole, honestly, a whole bucket of things that interest him. And he always says, anytime he's talking to people, he can always pinpoint, oh, you like that? I I know something about yeah. that, right? Otherwise, if all you do is just focus on like that one thing, it will be harder to build relationships with people because if you if they haven't seen that one movie that you've seen, mm, it's going to be kind of hard to converse with them, right? It's funny he says that. I've never heard anybody say that before other than myself, but I agree so much i it's it's kind of a joke in my family whenever i meet somebody it's rare i can't connect with them in some way about where they're from not necessarily because i've been there but because i might know something about the history of the place or i you know had a friend of a friend who lived there or you know i worked on a on a project where um you know the, the product was going to be sold in that in that region or country so i couldn't agree more that's really really helpful in uh in growing your network and when you grow your network you, you grow yourself and you grow your business opportunities for sure in my I, so in the book I'm writing right now, I talk about this and I call these points of significance. And as people, and when we're communicating with other people, it's so critical to be an active listener, right? And I think you can probably agree with this, but it's when you're conversing with somebody, and this is for those who are watching and trying to find some communication tips, this is a communications tip. It's when you are engaging with somebody, being mindful and picking up cues of, oh, they mentioned that, or they mentioned this. Let me add on to something. Actually, one of my clients that I was working with, she's she's a CFO of a large company up in the Bay Area. And I've been working with her on her communications. And and she always and she admitted it. She had trouble connecting with people. But I told her, you know, it's sometimes as simple as saying, oh, the color of your shirt. That's the color of my alma mater. Right. And just yeah. kind of using that something as simple as that to start a conversation. Yeah, it can go a long way. Uh, no doubt. Yeah, I think. Uh, and also, sometimes when you don't know what to say, just asking somebody to say more about something they said helps. You know, if they say, you know, oh, I love Costa Rica. Oh, tell me why. You know, have you been there? What, you know, do you have relatives from there? What's the story? Um, I find that can work well as well. So linking this back to our topic today, leadership in a global world, I think what Patrick and I are essentially just honing in on is that it's not so difficult to build connections when you are engaging with people in a global environment. And it goes back to what we just said earlier. It's this understanding of human nature. People, for the most part, do enjoy talking about themselves if you ask them, right? If you show genuine interest and genuine curiosity. So I'm actually curious, and I want to get our audience here, which, by the way, we have close to 50 people who are live right now joining us, and that's fantastic. Yeah, very global, too, I noticed. Very global, yeah. which is amazing. I feel like if everybody can just let us know where, what kind of industry are you in? Like, are you in a company that is global? Um, what's the role that you're in? It'd be really interesting to hear where everybody is dialing in from and what role they are in. But one question I have for you, Patrick. Okay, so for people who perhaps are interested 
in wanting to expand their reach in terms of, you know, because I imagine people who are watching this right now, they have some interest in leadership or something in the global environment. Do you have any tips for people for, you know, how can I get started or how can I position myself so that I am a good candidate to really represent my organization or, you know, just what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think one thing that I, let me start by saying what I, I don't think alone does it. I, I do think, and you know, we're on the medium of LinkedIn here, which I'm a big fan of, and I use it a lot, but it's very hard to just make cold call connections through LinkedIn. I still think that fundamentally um, knowing people who know people uh, and can introduce you is, is pretty critical. And that starts, um, whether we like it or not, with people that we're physically around. And so, uh, A, I would make sure that you, you know, people connect with those who are in their immediate sphere, in their neighborhoods, in their, in their jobs, uh, in their schools, whatever the, the uh, context might be. Um, and then the other thing is to, is to put yourself out there. I mean, we keep going back to the same theme, but when at work, uh, you know, they're, somebody's looking for a volunteer for a particular project, or even if they're not looking for volunteers, you making sure you let your supervisor know that you're interested in taking on uh, more projects and doing something different. Um, by virtue of doing those things, you can't help but get connected to other people. And those connections then over a long period of time, and by the way, that's the other thing is get, don't be impatient. You are kind of playing the long game here. I feel like I'm getting to be an old man now talking to youngsters out there, but uh, you'll have plenty of time and uh, nurturing those relationships that you have, no matter how few they may be to start, um, it's rare that that doesn't blossom into something else. Um, the other thing that's interesting is I, I would argue, and you know, it may sound a bit self-serving, but is seeking new educational opportunities. Um, you know, coming to get my MBA introduced me to a whole new cadre of people that I otherwise would have never known. And, and frankly, a, a group of people that are pretty darn impressive and that I still keep in touch with. That happened to me in the military. It happened to me when I went to undergraduate school. I went to master's degree but between the two. So I, I had a lot of schooling and I ended up meeting a ton of people through those uh, opportunities and have maintained those connections, which have helped uh, you know, advance my career. And then, uh, you know, frankly, getting to our uh, another topic that you and I are passionate about, which is communication, is that to the extent that you have a lot of conversations, I know this sounds silly, um, you do develop communication skills. And, and while, yes, you may develop them on an interpersonal basis, finding opportunities to communicate in front of larger groups by giving presentations, for example, I think is very, very critical uh, for advancement. Okay. Speaking of communications, was communication something, Patrick, something that came natural to you? Was, I don't know, are you introverted, extroverted? Is going out and just speaking to a, a new group something that you're very comfortable with? Like, where are you on the communications? And do you continue to improve on this skill? Uh, so yes, I'm an extrovert. I, I think uh, those that work with and for me would would say that uh, <laughs> emphatically. Um, and uh, yeah, as far as uh, you know, standing in front of a group and speaking, that's that's generally always been easy for me, and it's gotten easier as I've gotten older. In fact, recently we had a a combined meeting of the two groups that I I am responsible for in a large auditorium on campus at Harvard, and and I had a number of questions afterwards, people asking me, are you, you know, don't you get nervous doing that? And it's funny. I, I really don't. In fact, actually, I don't get very many nerves at all anymore, but I get a lot more nerves when it's a smaller audience than a really large audience. Larger mm -hmm. audiences are a little, uh, or a little easier. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been, um, I, I certainly would say there's some, uh, I don't know how much of this is nature nurture, but I've certainly had uh, an affinity for that from a very young age. Um, with respect to the issue of, of getting better at it, it's a really good one. You know, I've tried more recently to be more conscious of deliberately being better at it. I mean, I think I've improved just kind of organically because I do it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I am trying to be more conscious of, of how to, for example, get a point across with fewer words or use when I'm doing a presentation using imagery on a slide, not words, you know, something that tells a story. I think if you can do that well, um, you're going to be much more interesting to listen to. <laughs> Do you ever feel that somebody can reach the epitome of fantastic communications or do you feel like it's something that people can always improve on? No, I think you can always improve. I mean, I, uh, you know, in fact, if you ask me um, who's the best speaker I ever saw, I'm not sure I could name who that was probably because I could always think of something to nitpick about it. Um, and, uh, it, you know, in fairness, that person could turn around and 
you know, find 20, 20 more on me. So I'm not, it's not meant to say that I, I'm perfect on it because I'm not. But I do think that uh, that it's, you know, as we say, mathematics and asymptotically meaning the, the line approaches some limit, but it never really reaches it. I think that's kind of what uh, communication skills are like and leadership skills for that matter. So you mentioned that you don't really get nervous when you're speaking, but I know this is very nerve wracking for a lot of people. So please share how do you not, what do you, do you do anything to, to not feel nervous when you're in front of a group? Or if you do, how do you get over those nerves? Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that, um, and I don't know if this is helpful to other people, because I know everybody's different to your point. Some people are just, you know, it's that old, that old adage about how, you know, next to dying, it's the second most feared thing yeah. in the world is <laughs> speaking. Um, is that I, uh, I, I think to myself, whenever I have sat in an audience, um, I, and I think almost all audience members typically are giving the speaker their goodwill. Like they're not, they're not there to criticize you. They're not yeah. there to tear you apart. There are some exceptions here. I mean, if you're going to, if you give speeches on college campuses about, you know, highly charged political issues, you know, that all bets are off. Right. But for the most part, if you're, if you're speaking at a conference on blockchain or on leadership or, mm -hmm. or on the future of online education, whatever it is, uh, the people have showed up there and want to listen to you because they think you have something to say about that topic. So reminding yourself that that they come into that place with a mindset of goodwill makes it, I think, take some of the pressure off. They're not looking to tear you apart. Um, that still makes it hard, I know, for a lot of people. And sometimes for me, too, by the way, it makes it really hard to um, to not get you know a little bit nervous. I'll tell a quick and funny story once, though. I went to a an event with my wife um, that had like 300 people at it. And we went to check in. They said, oh, Mr. Mullane, welcome. We're looking forward to your talk today. I knew nothing of having to give a talk, uh, but they, they they wanted just a few words, you know, about, you know, is about our company being in this town. And um, as we're walking away, my wife said to me, oh my gosh, are you nervous? Don't, don't tell any jokes, be humble and keep it short. And then she asked again, are you nervous? And I said, well, I wasn't until now. You know, there's almost that thing where unless somebody introduces the doubt, you, you won't have it yourself. So, um, so yeah, I think just reminding yourself of that goodwill aspect of the listener is really helpful. That's such a funny story. It's like, I wasn't nervous, but now I am. <laughs> are, you, you're, are you suggesting that I should be yeah. nervous? <laughs> your loved ones are always tougher. Actually, your loved ones are probably the ones that don't come in with goodwill. They're, they're looking to be critical. So maybe that's part of the issue. This is so true. You know, I do so many workshops and I do a lot of speaking engagements, but I actually have done only very few of them in front of my husband too because sometimes I just get shy it's so I weird I don't know if it's because I'm like this is a part of me that you know he doesn't often see but if I'm in front of like hundreds of people I I kind of put on this different hat of like you know this is Jessica with Soulcast Media but you know with my husband I have a I have a 10 month old baby it's I feel like it's just like a different side of me that yeah. it's like who are you <laughs> I can so by the way, I'm looking at the chat function right now, and it's so neat to see how people are dialing from so many different industries. We have the pharma industry, we have tech, we have a lot of folks in healthcare, financial services. This is so neat. And this is what I love about these events, because yes, we get people from all over the world, but we have such a diverse set of folks from different industries converging on a topic that arguably we are all interested in. So I want to, again, kind of hone in a little bit more on communications because here at Soulcast Media, that is what we do. We do communications. So Patrick, like you said, you're, you're fairly extroverted and you don't really get nervous, but what do you do to prepare? Because I you mentioned that you do do a lot of speaking in, in that regards, whether it's short or long form. What's your process when you're thinking about, okay, I have to speak at this event or to to my team, how do you formulate or how do you approach it? Is there any strategy for you? Yeah, I I had some good advice once that, um, and actually, and, and I'll tie this to leadership too, because I think this is true, is that you're more effective generally as a communicator and you're much more effective as a leader if you can tell a story. And and when I say that, I, I mean it both literally and kind of figuratively. So you can tell a story to you know open up a discussion just to kind of get people loose and, and make yourself loose as well. Um, but you also, um, I, I like to describe something uh, as a narrative thread. It's nice to have throughout a, a presentation, no matter what it's about, a, a story that you can start with and maybe go back to at the end, because I think it does a nice job of bookending a topic and emphasizes what's in the middle. So I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of doing that. 
Um, part of it comes from, by the way, um, I've learned a lot at, while I've been at Harvard Business School. For those who don't know, we, we teach using what's called the case method of learning, which is basically learning through storytelling. You know, you're, you read something about a real manager facing a real problem, and then you're asked to put yourself in their shoes and, and let the world know what you would do to solve that problem. And so um, th that uh, pedagogy, that way of teaching I've learned is very effective. And I think it's effective because our brains are wired to want to listen to stories. So I'm really big on no matter the topic, trying to weave a story in from beginning uh, to end. Now, sometimes if it gets to be relatively technical, I'm, I, you know, I know this can be this can be tougher. Um, but I think that anybody who is is either leading, because I do think that people are going back to this issue about humans, um, you know, ha having similar things in their DNA. One of those similar things is a joy of storytelling. It's the reason that Hollywood's a billion dollar industry or built multi billion dollar industry. That, you know, if you can really focus on that, it it helps you think more creatively about what you want to present. And it makes the people who are listening much more engaged. Storytelling is one of the most powerful medium to get an idea across. And I, I, I do want to hone in on this idea of storytelling because it is also relevant in a business scenario too. a lot of people are like, oh, storytelling, that's humanities. That has nothing to do with me. Right. That's like social studies or anything, yeah. you know, but from honestly, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, Patrick, what does storytelling have to do with business? Now I, I'll answer this first. So last week, my husband and I, we actually attended a Yale event. My husband went to Yale. So Patrick, I'm like, Harvard, Yale, different. But And my son's at Yale, so it's okay. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. So my husband went to Yale. And uh, it was very interesting. Yale's doing this. And you might have heard. I don't know if you've heard of it, Patrick. But they're doing this whole campaign about humanities and storytelling. And that was the event that we ended up going to together. Mm -hmm. They had a panelist because um, we were, were in California. And so they were holding this event hosted by Yale up in Hollywood. So their panelists were people who are working, of course, in Hollywood. And these are producers, writers. And of course, they start talking about storytelling. And all of them were not, of course, they have to, they're writing scripts, right? But they were also talking a lot about how when they're doing their research for writing stories, right? They are looking into very technical fields to understand how can I marry this technical concept and put it into a storytelling form? And I think this is still very relevant to understanding story in a business setting, including using data. Actually, today, I just published a LinkedIn um, newsletter about data storytelling and how you can marry data and stories together. I always tell folks, numbers are just numbers. We are the ones that give it meaning, and we give it meaning by putting a face behind it. But Patrick, how do you think about stories, and how do you make a business case telling stories? Well, I the... If you think about business strategy and vision, which, you know, anybody who's taken any kind of basic business course, you know, you, you hear all the work, talk about sitting down and writing a vision statement so you know where you're going, where you're leading this organization. And, and I think that has an important place, but um, it doesn't have an important place of getting back to this idea of a narrative thread, something that ties that thing way out in the future to today. So being able to to you know, tell a story again, this isn't quite as literal as we mean it. It's not like, you know, once upon a time, <laughs> but, yeah. but there is, there is this element of reminding people as a leader that, Hey, this is where we're trying to go. This is what we're going to do today to get there. And then repeating that over and over again. And that's your, that's the link between the present and the past. And to the, to the extent that every story has a beginning, a middle and an end, that's exactly what you're trying to navigate. You have the beginning, which is today, you have the middle, which is what you're going to be doing tomorrow. And you have the end, which is where you want to be when you're done doing whatever you're doing tomorrow. And so I think that if you can uh, find a way to, you know, tell people who you're responsible for that this is our vision, but by starting today and moving through this progression to the future, you're going to have much more likelihood that you'll get to where you're going. We actually, we use a formal strategic planning tool that does exactly that in HBS, um, executive education and online. And it seems to work really well. It gets kind of people buy into it because they can see why what they're doing today matters for tomorrow storytelling and why it's relevant in a global world. When I think about these, this connection, I think about how it's true. A lot of us have had experiences that other people have not had and vice versa. But even though people may not have had the same experiences at, as you, when you tell a story, you send, you are essentially evoking emotion. Emotion is what all of us can relate to regardless mm -hmm. of where we are in the world happiness, sadness, 
frustration, stress, right? Mm -hmm. When you talk about that, ah, I get it, yeah. right? Even though you and I perhaps are in different industries. So I think that's where the power of storytelling is. I would agree. I mean, yeah, sorry, go on, go on. Oh, no, no, no. I was going to say, because we didn't really talk about this, but you also wrote a memoir. You wrote, you wrote a book. So I'm sure thinking about stories is something that you're constantly thinking about as well. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's funny when I when I wrote uh, the book, um, which is called The Father, Son and Holy Shuttle. And it, my father was an astronaut, so I grew up in kind of a unique family. And, and so the book is a humorous memoir about growing up in a in a kind of unique family. And while, while my father was doing things that could get him killed. Um, and, uh, I originally sat down to write little vignettes to share with my children. I didn't have an, in the intention of publishing it as a, as a memoir. Um, and to your point though, I, sh I shared it with people. And what I found was my own experiences, cause it's a very raw book and, and not raw in the sense that it's traumatic or anything raw in the sense that I don't really hold much back. I talk about the good, the bad, the ugly with respect to my own childhood and, and so forth. But what I was surprised by, and I don't know why, because as a reader, I'd experienced this myself, was how many people who grew up in completely different contexts related to what you were just talking about, the emotions of given events and, you know, being embarrassed as a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, being thrilled uh, when, it, when something good happened to you, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, and so uh, when I was when I was writing it, I didn't really have that that idea in mind. And now looking back on it, it seems silly I didn't because of what you said. People a good story people will relate to, even if it has nothing to do with their own life. And mm -hmm. it's the reason novels are popular, right? I mean, obviously most of us have not lived in Nazi Germany. Most of us have not flown to the moon, but if you read a great story about both of those things, you learn something and you learn something about yourself. Um, I think that's the power of it. Okay. So I want to pivot a little bit because I want to get your insight as the executive director at Harvard business school. Can you let us know, you know, from a, a university perspective, from a business school perspective, what are you seeing are the most important skills to really succeed in a global world? So what are you seeing are the most popular classes? What are you seeing are the skills that are needed? I'm sure this is something our audience can also think about as they continue to up-level their skills. Yeah, I think there's, so it, it's interesting, there's two things, the, the tried and true um, topic areas of a lot of business curriculums haven't changed and are still popular. You know, if you want to learn some accounting, some finance, mm -hmm. um, you know, we we have online courses and in-person courses for those uh, sorts of uh, disciplines. Um, what I would encourage people to do, though, is to make sure that they they add those kind of tactical skills, but in equal measure, really work on the softer skills, what we typically call softer skills. So those are things like communication. Those are things like leadership. Um, those are things like uh, empathy. I know it sounds silly, but learning how to be more empathetic, um, which, by the way, I need to learn how to be more empathetic. I'm not I'm certainly no saint in this regard. Um, and be, because in the end, um, I've always said this, I've said this for decades, but I think it, I found it to be true for almost every company and every senior manager who does any hiring is that if you give me two people who are exactly the same, with the exception of one difference, let's say you're hiring somebody to be a I'll pick something like a, uh, a software developer, you know, something very technically uh, driven. If you have two software developers and on a scale of one to 10, their skills in software development, this person is a 10 and this person is a seven. And then when it comes to the, what I call their EQ, you know, not my term, but their emotional mm -hmm. emotion, how, how well they relate to other people, how well they work on teams and so forth. And the person who has the 10 in, in software development is a four on that scale. But the person who has a seven on the software development is an eight, nine or 10 on that scale. I'll take the person with less software development skills any day because individual contributors in this world, for the most part, and there are exceptions, um, don't, I shouldn't say individual contributors, people who, who are islands under themselves because they don't want to be part of a team and because they don't do the work uh, to figure out how to be empathetic, how to relate to other people. Um, a, people aren't going to want you on your team and B, your employment opportunity is going to be very limited. So I think it's really important to to work on those uh, soft skills. Now, what's interesting is you may ask yourself, well, like I run an online group. How do you learn soft skills in an online education course? Which, by the way, most of ours don't have live teaching either. It's all asynchronous, meaning there is no live faculty teaching. But our faculty have done a great job of creating programs where, for example, in one of them, you have to fill out a very deep. Uh, before you start the program, a very deep self-assessment about who you are. You know, it's an instrument where you get results back. So when you take the course, 
you already have a view into who you are and the course keeps pulling you back to that. So you can learn more about yourself and learning more about yourself is critical to getting those EQ skills, those emotional skills uh, really ramped, ramped up. But you need both of them. One, uh, one or the other by themselves isn't very useful. The two together, man, that is, that's superpower sort of stuff. That is powerful stuff. I love how you said that though. It's, you know, you rather take the person who has less technical skills, but high soft skills, emotional intelligence, because on, arguably that person is going to be a better team player, is going to be willing to learn. And I honestly agree. I think that is, those are the kind of people your team wants to work with. And I'm very curious, I'm sure for the folks who are on here, which we have almost 50 of you all, if you think back to the people who you do enjoy working with, why do you enjoy working with them, right? Is it because they are more open-minded or are they just combative, right? People yeah. generally don't want to work with people who are constantly combative, arguing, defending, right? I think people who have great soft skills, great communication skills, great empathy, you know, any of those things, they are open-minded. And I think that is really the formula of what makes a really good team. Now, that's interesting. Okay, so you're saying, at least at Harvard Business School, what you're seeing, the skills that people really enjoy or at least are most popular yes is those technical skills but that's actually really reassuring for me to hear that the future leaders you know who are at who are at harvard business school they are wanting to up level their soft skills oh yeah there's there's a substantial amount of coursework in the mba program in our in-person executive education that is related to the self you know because if you if you don't understand that and you don't improve it then everything else doesn't really matter there's plenty of people that had lots of smarts, but just could not lead a team or rally a team or, you know, get people to feel connected to them in a way that would really make them successful. And, and you know, the, the literature is littered with failures because of that. And I will also say leadership is not just for leaders. I think anybody at any level can learn leadership skills. In fact, I feel like those who learn leadership skills early on, they are positioning themselves to get into a leadership manager role, even though they may not be in. I've always been very interested in actually leadership as well. Even when I was, I think like when I first graduated college and when I was 21, I was already starting to read leadership books because what I love about leadership is it actually teaches you about people. I honestly yeah, think I, and you, you would touch on something there, this self-leadership idea. My father, I'll steal one of his stories. You know, he 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 was unusual in that he knew from the day he was born, he wanted to be an astronaut. And this was and he was born in a day when there was no such thing as an astronaut. But you could see it coming. Um, he was born right at the end of World War II. Um, but every everybody who had become an astronaut up until that point in his life when when he wanted to do it, when he came into the years where he could apply, had been a fighter pilot. He wasn't a fighter pilot. He flew in the backseat of airplanes. He was a navigator, like a goose in Top Gun. That was my dad's job. And no gooses had ever been selected to be astronauts. And so he thought his dream was dead. But he said, you know what, I'm just going to I'm going to be the best I can be at whatever I'm doing and really focused on doing that. Well, lo and behold, the NASA changed the rules about 10 years after he thought his dream was done. And he got selected in the very first group of spatial astronauts because, as he likes to say, I kept on doing my, my best when I didn't when most people thought it didn't count. Um, it matters that you think it counts and that you you push yourself. That's the self leadership uh, that we're that I'm talking about. And if you do that, then good things will happen to you. It may take time. It may not be in the form you expect. But if you do those things, good things will happen. There, I feel like that's that that internal fire, right? That, you know, you're not letting external influences influence you because there's always going to be people around you criticizing, you know, being negative. But I think it's kind of what you said is just having that intern that, that internal fire to say, in the end, I'm I'm almost I'm almost doing this for myself because I do want to be the best I can be. So for those who are watching and listening, it's you know, the question for you all is what is it that you are doing? Is it something that you love? If it is, how can you continue to pursue? And hey, you know, if you're doing something that you don't necessarily enjoy, how can you pivot and expand your knowledge, your skills to do something else? Because truly, with online education, learning, it's so accessible these days. I mean, I'm a LinkedIn learning instructor. Um, you all can have access to that. You know, it's just like, it's there. It's on the internet. It's just, you have to take the time. Of course, sometimes you have to pay, but a lot of it is not that ex that expensive, honestly, to learn how to upskill, up level what it yeah. is. So we're about to wrap up here. By the way, I feel like this conversation just flew by. So Patrick, as we start to wrap up here, 
What are some, I like to call them golden nuggets. What are some golden nuggets you'd like to share with our audience of leadership in a global world? If people were to walk away from today's event, remembering this one thing, what would you want that one thing to be? Um, I'm going to steal something that Vivek said in the chat, which is that soft is hard. I, it, you know, that it, it's easy to not work on those soft skills, uh, be it communications, you know, leadership, empathy, the things we were talking about. Um, because they're, they are more amorphous. There's less content out there that addresses these things. Um, and because it really, really takes self-reflection to do it well. So uh, I would encourage people to really focus on those areas. The, the hard skills will come. Um, you know, most people know how to get those. The soft skills are tougher. So spend time on them. And I think uh, you know, you'll find that you can improve over time. I almost think that the synonym to leadership is soft skills. Yeah. I, I think that's what it needs, what leadership needs. Leadership and leading well is really going back to what we just talked about in the very beginning. It's human. It's human nature. It's understanding people, what motivates people. And I think if you are a leader or an aspiring leader and you know what motivates people and gets them to do the work, gets them to feel inspired, I mean, that's leadership. Yeah. These days, leadership isn't so much dictating and telling people, you got to do this, you got to do that. Right. It's being, it's going in with a collective mentality, right? I don't know. Is this something that you've seen too, Patrick, or the definition of leadership? Has that changed? Yeah, no, I, I think so. I mean, it, it is, as you said, it's all, it's all about the people side of what yeah. you do. And uh, it doesn't matter how smart you are. People don't follow smart, um, at least not alone. They follow people they feel that inspire them and that treat them well and understand their position. And and help their help those that work with and for them to aspire to greater heights. You know, basically to be able to do uh, do with your leadership what they may not have been able to do without it. Um, but that said, it's not a heavy hand, like you said. It's not it's not about telling them exactly what to do. In fact, that doesn't usually work. It's just setting the right circumstances, um, you know, so that in the right culture, so that it can happen organically. And if you can do that, then you know, some magic happens for sure. I always tell folks think back to a manager that you really enjoyed working for? What was it that you enjoyed working with them? Like, what was it about them? I mean, I, I chances are there was a big part of it. They made you feel like they that you were in a psychologically safe space, right? Yeah. Where, where you could ask questions, you can share what's on your mind, and they weren't there to criticize you, right? So yeah. I think, I think that's what leadership is. It's, you know, it's not reserved for, and this is kind of like the closing conclusion of our talk today, is just understanding that leadership it's not necessarily the technical skills. It's really understanding people and it's being a good team player. Leadership is the soft skills, which is something that we can all learn. Education is very accessible these days. And I think you can definitely vouch on that too. You know, whether you are at Harvard Business School's online education or not, right? You can learn soft skills anywhere, really. And, and I think that is really leadership today. So Great. Patrick, where can people find you if they want to stay connected with you? Um, please let everybody know. Well, I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> Patrick Mullane, you see my name there. And uh, my email address is patrick at pjmullane.com. So I can be reached there as well. And I have a website with the same URL as my email address, uh, uh, www.pjmullane.com. So all those places. I have to ask if anybody's curious, like if people want to apply for Harvard Business Online School, how do they do that? Is it really hard to get in? How can they position themselves to get in? Yeah, they, uh, it's online.hbs.edu and they can see our online programs. And if they search uh, Harvard Business School Executive Education, they can see some of our in-person programs too. Again, these are the non-degree programs. And because they're non-degree, they're not, they're, they're, it's not like, you know, only 2% of people who are applying get in. In fact, we're, we're looking to be more expansive because we're a mission-driven institution and we love, we believe what we have to teach matters to the world. So if, uh, if you think, getting back to what we said before, if you think you'd be somebody who would excel at it, then apply. You never know. So here at Soulcast Media, we are all things communications. And for those who have attended this event, our other future events, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we host these about two times a month. So we have another one coming up in about a week and a half. So for those who are interested in attending that one, 
head to our website, soulcastmedia.com. That is where we post all our events. For today's event, if you missed anything that Patrick and I talked about, you jumped on late and you want to catch all the golden nuggets that we talked about, be sure to check out our Soulcast Media VIP pass. We combine all our tips from this event as well as all our events together for you. So you don't have to watch a whole hour worth of content. We essentially put it together for you. So that's the VIP pass, which you can see here on our screen. As a bonus, and this is I'm just letting you all know for the first time, I'm going to be doing an office hour for our VIP pass holders. So we're going to be opening up a session where I'll be, it'll be on Zoom, where I'll be meeting all our VIP folks. So if you grab a VIP pass, that is a great way for you to meet me. And we will be talking about all things communications. So Patrick, thank you so much for being here, for taking your afternoon to join us. And everybody who stayed on, thank you. And for anybody, I know there's going to be a lot of people watching the replay of this. Very glad that you are all taking the time to up-level your leadership skills in a global world. So thank you, Patrick. And thank thanks, you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care.